Welcome. Biological factors influence thought, emotions, and behavior. Do you believe that statement from chapter two? Person and situation. We've talked about enduring issues. Let's consider for the biological basis of behavior each of the enduring issues of psychology and the questions asked in this unit. To what extent is behavior caused by internal processes, like areas of the brain, as opposed to environmental processes? Can someone react with their brain? Is it the environmental factors? Are the environmental factors triggering the brain's reaction? Have you ever heard of genetic predisposition? You know, when you go into the doctor's office, they ask you if anyone in your family has had cancer or diabetes. They're looking for, why would they ask that? I mean, that person is not you, but that genetic predisposition. To what extent does heredity affect behavior or your psychological makeup? How likely is it that you'll end up with a mental health concern or poor behavioral choices based on your heredity? Does our nervous system mature at some point and no longer develop if you consider the issue of stability versus change? How much does experience lead to its evolution? So if the system changes, how much does the experience, whatever we go through in life, lead to that change, lead to its evolution? So stability versus change, does the nervous system change due to experience or does it stay the same throughout the lifespan once development is done? Diversity versus universality. Are there differences between men and women in the way their brain works? Are, have you, if you've read the books or have you seen the books, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, it's kind of playing in that concept of men and women function very differently. Are there differences between the male and female brain? What role does hormones play within that? If women are aggressive, is that because of something they're exposed to in the womb? Um, there's a video under your resources section about, it says, which sex is your brain? And I think it's worth um, watching. And this whole chapter centers around mind and body enduring issues. If my foot experienced pain, how does my mind react? How does the brain create the experience of the mind? Neuropsychologists during the decade of the brain discovered areas of the brain active during different activities. This was made possible due to available technology. So what is the connection between what we experience and our biological processes? What we experience and our biological processes. Well, let's get to it. Let's define some terms and to consider what, um, what the biological basis of behavior is. What does the brain do to influence how we function psychologically? Psychobiology focuses on the biological basis of behavior and mental processes. So it's an umbrella. We stated in Unit 1 that phys physiological psychology investigates the biological behavior. The field of neuroscience studies the brain and nervous system specifically. And then psychobiology, or psychobiology is the branch of psychology dealing directly with biological basis of behavior and mental processes. These are all related. Um, I had always heard the term physiological psychology. I took a course in my undergrad for this. I have a big, thick textbook. If you're interested, further breaking down what we're going to study this week in Unit 2. Um, so your book does not reference back to physiological psychology as it's stated in Chapter 1 during my readings. So if you can just know that those terms are interchangeable, but for your test, you want to know the differentiation that psychobiology is a broad umbrella, where neuroscience is specifically the brain and the nervous system. So what is the nervous system? It's the complex network of cells that carry information to and from all over, from all parts of the body. We'll consider each element of the nervous system, and we have to start with the smallest unit, which is the neuron. Neurons are the messengers of the body. 
because they receive and transmit information. Depicted on your screen are the elements of the neuron, and we're going to go through one by one. The cell body is made up of a nucleus um, with a complete set of chromosomes and genes, a cell membrane, and a lot of other things that are characteristic of, of cells. But it's different from other cells because of dendrites, which they are this section here. And the point of dendrites are to pick up incoming messages from other neurons and transmit it to the cell body. Where there's an input, there needs to be an output. Because remember, neurons are the messengers. They receive information and then they transmit it. The axon sends out outgoing messages to maybe another neuron, a muscle, or a gland. It's covered with a needle-lined sheath that insulates and protects these neurons. This sheath may speed up the neural message as well. Not all neurons have this. You see that there? They don't all have it. What exactly is a nerve? A nerve is a bunch or a group of axon, axons bundled together, similar to the bundling of wires in a cable cord. The next time you tell someone they're getting on your nerves, you'll know what that means. And then there's terminal buttons at the end of each axon that release neurotransmitters, which we're going to consider momentarily. What are the different types of neurons out there? You have the sensory or afferent, and these are the ones that carry messages from the sensory organs to the spinal cord or brain. So they're going to the spinal cord or brain. Motor are the ones, the neurons that carry, or efferent, are the neurons that carry messages from the spinal cord or brain to the muscles and glands. So that makes sense. They're sending messages to the muscles or glands, telling them what to do, which means motor, yeah? Where the sensory are taking sensory information to the brain or spinal cord to tell it what to do. Then the association neurons or the inner neurons are the ones that send messages back and forth to each other. There are also mirror neurons, which mimic other neuron behavior. They seem to be involved in sensations and feelings and um, uh, maybe even empathy and response and understanding others. So there's more needed, more research needed for the mirror neurons. Know the difference between the sensory neurons, the motor neurons, and the inner neurons. And you can see the other terms there for them. So how exactly? do neurons transmit these messages? We saw the structure. We know that there are dendrites that receive the information. We got that. But then there are axons that send it out. But there's these things called terminal buttons. What does that mean? Neurons are not connected per se. There's a gap between called a synaptic state. A synapse is an axon terminal of one neuron, synaptic space, which is the actual gap, and the dendrites and cell body of the next neuron. For the message to go from one neuron to the next neuron, the neuron has to actually fire. And your book, book excellently states the process of these neural impulses. If you're interested to know how they fire, please see page 44. Once it does fire, the impulse goes down the axon, out through the terminals, and into this terminal bu button. Once the neural impulse fills um, the synaptic vesicle, neurotransmitters are released. I conceptualize it like the machine at the arcade. The one where you, if you drop a quarter in, it pushes 
your quarter pushes other quarters closer to the edge. And I picture it that way. Once that neural impulse is sent down the line and it fills up that, that space, well, it pushes something out of the way when it fills it up. When the neurotransmitter is released, it seeks its corresponding receptor site. It's kind of like a locking key. You can see that, that little, it looks for, it goes from one neuron to the next, and on the next neuron is that, um, is that receptor site. It keeps it orderly, there's a pathway. What exactly do neurotransmitters do? They're chemicals released by the synaptic vesicles that travel and affect ad adjacent neurons. There's more to them than that, though. This is just another picture. We're going to talk about neurons. This is just another picture of how um, there's that synaptic transmission. This is from um, the 2010 edition, I believe, of this book. But I like how it shows there's an actual space between the two neurons and how they connect. So hopefully that's helpful to you as well. Neurotransmitters are chemicals, and different neurotransmitters have different effects. Um, on your screen, you see the listing of different um, neurotransmitters, and I encourage you to be aware of them um, because they're talked about often, like dopamine, um, which is the second one down. They do say it's involved um, in a wide variety of behaviors and emotions, like pleasure and pain. What's interesting, though, is that we know that if I give someone a medication, and I don't prescribe medications, if I give someone a medication that increases their dopamine, they have symptoms similar to schizophrenia. And I find that rather interesting um, because that's one of the reasons that some individuals believe that people with schizophrenia, those positive symptoms come from too much dopamine within their body. And then serotonin is involved in the regulation of sleep, dreaming, mood, especially mood is discussed, um, eating, pain, and aggressive behavior. Norepinephrine, arousal, wakefulness, learning, memory, mood. Um, endorphins, that's inhibition of pain, release during strenuous exercise, maybe because of that runner's high. Your book has, the 2013 edition has more listed. I encourage you to be aware of them because when people mention them, like ACH, you want to be able to know what that means. What I like even better is it talks about how chemical substances affect us because of neurotransmitters, like how caffeine affects us, how cocaine affects us. By the way, it's dopamine running through your body, not able to be um, reabsorbed from the synapse, <coughs> antidepressants, and so on and so forth. You are required to watch the videos about the one is called Drugs to Restore Chemical Balance, and the other is Alcohol in the Brain, because they both are implied when it comes to neurotransmitters. So you can either click on this link right now, or you can go to the required videos in um, Unit 3, or Week 3. There's an actual separate folder that says Required Videos, and watch those videos. A neat element of the nervous system is this neural um, plasticity, and this is the ability of the brain to be changed structurally and chemically by experience. And this was discovered um, by the scientist named on your screen. I, want to, I don't want to butcher his name. Um, he showed the importance of experience to neural development. He said that rats raised in more complex environments had larger neurons and more synaptic connections. And other research has found those rats raised in those more complex environments are better at solving problems. So experience can change the brain structurally and chemically. Repeated stimulation of the same area 
or region of the brain, like the hippocampus, causes neurons to respond vigorously for weeks after the stimulation. This is a long-term potentiation, LTP, and this appears to be involved in learning and storing new information. That is a lot. That says a lot to us. So if I am working with my son, I would want him to have more synapses, um, synapse connections. I want him to learn more information. So I want to make the environment complex like the rats. And you can see on your screen, if it's an inner rich cage, there's more synaptic connections. And again, it, it seems to be because the neurons, once they're stimulated, they go into that long-term potentiation, and that allows for new information, more neural connections. Neurons are functionally connected to one another through plasticity, allowing for neural um, networks as a result of experience. These are the basis these are the foundation for all psychological processes and lead to the differences between people. You have a child that's not, it does not, and we're going to talk about this next week in the maturation develop, or, and development unit. If you have a child who um, is growing up, you want them to be exposed to complex environments. You want them to learn. When my son was three months old, I needed to show him patterns because they want to develop those neural networks. But the way I develop my neural networks depends on where I'm from. And the way you, yours become, come about is the way that you grow up, where you're from. I mean, certainly I'm not one, I'm not Dr. Corey. Don't lay on my couch and tell me all about your childhood and blame your childhood. And I don't believe Dr. Corey did this, but this is a common misconception. Blame your childhood for all the things that have gone wrong in your life. However, there is an impact of childhood, of environment, on these neural networks. So if I was raised one way, I'm going to think differently because of these neural networks react differently than someone else who was raised very different, differently. And that's what your discussion board question rotates around. Neurogenesis is an interesting concept, and it offers a lot of hope for us as, as a race, as a human race. Um, it's that Adult brains can produce new brain cells, neurons. So children, they can produce that. There's a lot of brain development, especially in the first two years, and then again in puberty. But the recent research has revealed that adult brains are capable of producing new brain cells too. This overturned a decades-old belief that organisms were born with all the brain cells they would ever have. Neurogenesis Genesis, excuse me, raises new possibilities for the treatment of neurological disorders, spinal cord injury, either through the use of fetal stem cells or by stimulating the brain's own stem cells to pro, um, provide self repair. And you can imagine the implications of this research. I love these, the next two statements, that's why I included them. To, I think they really clarify about neural, um, the two concepts, neuroplasticity. Furthermore, they demonstrate that neuroplasticity is a feedback loop. Experience leads to changes in the brain, which in turn facilitates new learning, which leads to further neural change and so on. So it's a circle. I'm exposed to something, I have an experience, I have new neural networks, I have new learning, and then my, that sets off another whole round. So I might experience new things because of that new learning and then more changes within the brain. I, I also love this statement and this is what you'll be discussing on the discussion board. Because people from the same culture share similar experiences their neural networks would tend to be similar to one another than they would be to people from a different culture. I think that's something we need to discuss when we're considering diversity. Let's talk about the central nervous system. It is composed of two divisions, or excuse me, well, the central nervous system is composed of two areas, the brain and spinal cord. But the nervous system itself is composed of two areas. You have the central nervous system, 
which includes, like I said, the brain and spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which consists of nerves carrying messages back and forth from the central nervous system to other areas like sense organs, um, sensory organs, muscles, and glands. We're going to study the peripheral nervous system in a couple minutes. Let's talk more about the central nervous system. Let's talk about the brain. Um, we're going to start with the central core because it's believed that it developed first. The main structures and areas of this part of the brain, you might want to get out your worksheet. The hindbrain is located with where the central, um, excuse me, where the spinal cord enters the skull. It's believed to be the earliest part that evolved because it's found in more primitive um, vertebrae. It contains um, the medulla, the um, pons, and the cerebellum. And we're going to talk about what they are on the next slide. So just know that the hindbrain is where the spinal cord um, enters the skull. The midbrain is right above the hindbrain, and it's important for hearing and for sight. This is one of the areas that pain is registered. The thalamus is um, relays sensory information to appropriate locations in the brain. I love how your book describes these egg-shaped, um, uh, uh, excuse me, egg-shaped structures as the relay center of the brain. The hypothalamus, this is very important to me as a psychologist, although all areas play into it. It governs motivation, and when we cover motivation, you're going to hear that it's not just motivation to get my work done. It's thirst, hunger, sexual drive, body temperature. So the hypothalamus controls that, governs that, but it also governs some emotional responses. Maybe this is why certain motives lead to certain bodily reactions. I would have to study this more to know if that's the actual connection. The reticular um, formation is a network of neurons whose function is to alert and arouse the higher parts of the brain in response to incoming messages. Alert, alert. This section can be subdued through general anesthesia, through sleep, where your um, re responses aren't as quick. Let's look a little bit more into those hindbrain um, structures. And if you need this um, clarified, look at the cliff notes or look in your book or look at the note pages for this house. So the hindbrain is believed to be the basic functions of, of living, where the, the structures in this area, the medulla, is it controls essential life support functions like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, and you see on there she's got her fingers up to her neck, taking her pulse at what it looks like. That's the medulla. The palm, this governs sleep and wake cycle. You can see who's yawning there. You can see where those parts are at. The cerebellum, it controls certain reflexes, sense of balance, and coordinates bodily motion, um, movement. It's considered the little brain because it contains more neurons than the rest of the brain. It appears that it might be involved in emotional control, attention, memory, and coordination of sensory information, according to one of the researchers um, cited in your book. But for now, know that it's um, associated with reflexes, sense of balance, and the coordination of motor movement, um, bodily movement. The cerebral cortex is a thin layer of gray matter that covers both hemispheres of your brain. And this is normally what people think of when they think of the brain. It's, it completely covers the um, cerebrum. Interestingly, if the cerebral cortex was spread out, your text says it would cover two to three square feet and would be thick as the letter T. In addition, the way it folds, you know, because there's all those grooves, it's unique to each one of us. It's almost like a fingerprint. So what does it do? It um, processes thought, vision, language, memory, and emotion. It's divided up into two hemispheres, the right and the left, and each hemisphere is divided into four lobes. And there's also, there's like, um, things that divide the lobes, and those are listed in your book. There's association areas, there are large areas of each lobe of the cortex 
where incoming messages from separate senses are combined into meaningful impressions and outgoing messages from motor areas are integrated. So let me close the brain. Even though there's the left and the right, they are both um, they both contain equal abilities. So with what are they? You have the frontal cortex. This coordinates messages from the other three lobes of the cortex and serves as the executive control center for the brain. I always say that our the higher order thinking is in the front of our head. The story is uh, the story of Mr. Gage, which we're going to watch in the video. I'll reference that on the next slide. It dramatically illustrates what happens when this frontal lobe is damaged. And there's two different parts of the frontal, there's parts of the frontal lobe. One is the primary motor cortex. It's responsible for voluntary mo movement, where the prefrontal cortex, and this is what often I reference, is the goal-directed behavior, the impulse control, the judgment, the um, metacognition. So on your worksheet, note that the frontal lobe, it coordinates that, and it's the executive control center, but the pre Prefrontal cortex is involved in goal-directed behavior, impulse control, judgment, and metacognition. What's interesting is it's believed that that, that, pre, that frontal lobe, that prefrontal cortex, continues to develop all the way through like age 27 or so. So when teenagers act impulsively, we can't imagine why they didn't exercise better judgment. Their brain is not done. The next part is the part that receives and interprets visual information. And then you have the part, the lobe, that receives sensory information from throughout the body. And um, messages from the sense receptors are registered here. The temporal lobe, it regulates hearing, balance, equilibrium, and certain emotions and motivations. So all four of those, you have to note both their name. I'm going to note the, you got to write down the part so you know exactly where they're located, as well as the function. Now I encourage you to go watch the video on Mr. Gage and learn how that, that impact to that prefrontal cortex area and that frontal lobe changed who he was. The limbic system is only fully developed in mammals. It plays a role in learning and emotional behavior. The hippocampus plays an essential role in formation of new memories. People with damage to the hippocampus can still remember information prior to the damage, just not new information. The amygdala governs and regulates emotions and establishes emotional memories. There's a lot of research stating that the structure determines our initiation of a fear response. There's an example in your book about a woman who couldn't feel fear despite knowing she should be afraid due to damage to the amygdala. I attended PTSD training, a post-traumatic stress disorder training, where they focus much attention that there, if a child sustains damage to this area through trauma, that it affects their overall function. And this is where the brain can change. Let's look at the different hemispheres. The right hemisphere controls touch and movement of the opposite side of the body. And it's usually superior at nonverbal, visual, and spatial tasks. So the right hemisphere, you can see on that, is all about spatial and all about, um, it's all about nonverbal and visual, where the left hemisphere controls um, writing and movement of the opposite side of the body, dominant in language, and involves um, symbolic reasoning. You're going to watch a video about um, somebody who lost the left side of um, their left hemisphere and how that affected them. And then you have the corpus, oh goodness, um, I hope I'm saying this right, calcium, calcium, 
um, which allows for the exchange of information between the two hemispheres. So if you'll click on this link or if you'll go to the discussion or go to week three's unit, you can then um, hear the information about the girl that had her, the left hemisphere removed and how that impacted her. A split brain patient is one who has had that um, connection cut so that that way it'll stop the seizures more than likely is the reason that they would have that cut. So the, the corpus callosum, um, I hope I'm saying that correctly again, it, it allows that communication between the two hemispheres. So if it is cut, how does it affect the person? Positively, it reduces or eliminates seizures. However, it also leads to the two hemispheres operating independently of one another. Most of the time, because the sensory information comes into both um, hemispheres, that it doesn't really necessarily impact someone's functioning. They can still function fully. But it does impact them in a select couple of ways. And your book, you can see how the, the left visual field, um, field is the right hemisphere and the right visual field is the left hemisphere. Your book explains the split brain experience. So this video, and I encourage you to watch these two videos because I think it does a better job. One, in that you can see it, and two, you can see the experiment playing out. Two, I just like its further explanation. So if you'll please click on that link or go to unit three to watch these two videos. Broca's area and Vernick's area, and that's how I heard his last name pronounced. So please um, let me know if I'm wrong. Generally are only found on the left side of the brain and they work together enabling us to both produce and understand speech and language. And we're going to talk about um, speech and language in the future. Broca's area is in the frontal lobe and it's involved in the production of speech. And when there's damage there, it affects the ability to talk, but not the ability to understand spoken or written language. Vernick's area is involved in our understanding of spoken or written language, and damage to it makes it difficult to comprehend language, but the speech is hardly affected. And then there's aphasia, and these are the pro it's a problem understanding receptive aphasia or producing expressive aphasia, usually resulting from damage to either one of these areas. Um, the receptive aphasia would be the vernix area, and the expressive aphasia would be the um, Broca's area. A common misconception in the hem, um, so how do we study the brain? What are the tools available to us? We have um, a micro electrode techniques, and they're used to discover the function of single neurons. So micro, little, so these are single neurons. Macro electro techniques are used to obtain an overall picture of the activity in a particular region of the brain. So that's um, macro larger. An EEG, and hopefully you've heard that before, it's a graph of so-called brain waves that produce an index of um, strength and rhythm of neural activities. Structural imaging produces a 3D image of the brain. You might have a CAT scan or a CT scan or an MRI. A CAT scan is an X-ray um, that rotates around the body. The unit rotates, producing a 3D image of the brain. The MRI is a magnetic field capturing the energy released by different structures of the brain. Functional imaging um, is a technique that looks at the brain activity as it responds to sensory stimulation. The EEG imaging, the machine allows researchers to look at activity of the surface of the brain through electro, um, electro, excuse me, micro electrodes 
placed on the scalp and connected to an amplifier and a computer for data recording and analysis. And then the um, MEG and the MSI, they're similar to EEGs, but they're more accurate according to your author. A PET scan is where one takes, um, one has a radioactive sugar injected into the bloodstream to track the activity of brain cells. It's enhanced and color coded by a computer. And then the, um, F, the functional MRI, is tracking um, changes in the oxygen levels of the brain and which, through that, which areas of the brain are active. For your tests, be able to name a way that you can study the brain. The other part of the central nervous system is the spinal cord. It's a complex cable of neurons that run down the spine, connecting the brain to most of the rest of the body. And it operates as a communication superhighway. So know for your test the function of the spinal cord. This is all about communication and connecting the brain to the rest of the body. So the spinal cord is composed of motor neurons that descend from the brain and this controls the internal organs and the muscles. And then there are sensory neurons ascending and they deliver information from the extremities and internal organs to the brain. And then there's the inner neurons um, that exist as well. And remember, we discussed how they're the ones that communicate to one another. So the spinal cord contains these neural circuits that involve these three elements, these three types of neurons, and it produces these reflex movements that don't require the brain to think. They don't require input from the brain. So you touch a hot surface, and you can watch on your screen, you touch a hot surface, and the sensory receptors in your finger respond. The sensory fibers carry the message to the spinal cord. The inner neurons in the spinal cord relay the message to the motor nerve fibers. And then those motor nerve fibers send a message to the muscle located in the hand. And then you remove your finger. The peripheral nervous system is our next step. It's wonderful that the brain and spinal cord work as so, but their information needs to get to the rest of the body, like the sensory receptors, the glands, the internal organs, and the skeletal muscles. It allows the peripheral nervous system allows you to make a quick response to remove your hand from the hot pan. There are two in the peripheral nervous system. You have the automatic and then the somatic. And the automatic has two different divisions. You have the sympathetic nerve, uh, division, and then you have a parasympathetic division. Let's talk about what the, um, the somatic nervous system, let's talk about what it does, because there's not a separate slide for it. It contains the sensory pathway or the neurons carrying messages to the central nervous system. So that was. This is part of um, when you touch that, when he touched that candle, or she touched that candle, as you saw on the screen before. That was somatic for the vision of the peripheral nervous system that sent the message to the central nervous system, to the spine, and then it was sent back. So the somatic nervous system contains the sensory pathway or the neurons carrying messages to the central nervous system and the motor pathway or the neurons carrying messages from the central nervous system to the voluntary muscles. So somatic think senses. The automatic we're going to break down further. Just like we talked about with the rest of the body, um, it links, as I said, the peripheral nervous system links the brain and the spinal cord to the rest of the body. You have afferent um, neurons which we talked about, those are your sensory ones. They carry the messages from the sense organs to the spinal cord and brain. And then the efferent neurons, which carries the information from the central nervous system to the muscles and glands. Do you think about efferent if you want to, um, it's external. I mean, we already said that you can use the term, and I'll use that on your test. Afferent is sensory. Efferent is motor. Hopefully that makes it clear.
the sympathetic um, division of the automatic nervous system, which is the division of the peripheral nervous system, that's our fight or flight. So that engages our fight or flight system, prepares us to react to stress. And the amygdala is involved in this process. And what happens is, is that within this um, nervous system, it causes our pupils to dilate. Um, we, it might slow down our, uh, there might be a little more saliva. It makes your heart beat faster. It um, stops your digestion. It makes you breathe faster by dilating the, um, those um, bronchi. Um, and it, it relaxes the bladder. So that all happens during that fight or flight. What happens when you get stressed? You, the book gives the example of you seeing a bear if you're on a hike. Heart pounding, faster breath, your pupils get larger. So that's this division of the automatic nervous system. So know that the sympathetic portion is from that fight or flight. You gotta slow down. So the parasympathetic nervous system, division of the automatic nervous system, it restores and maintains the day-to-day -day functioning of the organ, calming the body after it reacts to stress. And I try, I just recently worked with a client with OCD and she does compulsions. She has obsessive compulsive disorder. She does compulsions of cleaning in order to initiate the parasympathetic uh, para division because she's constantly engaging in that fight or flight. And so it slows her down and we're gonna teach her if she waits long enough, her body will automatically do it for her. So even though the responses are and the reactions are automatic, you can be in some control over these responses. We're gonna discuss biofeedback in the unit on learning. So we need to discuss in this chapter on the biological basis of behavior, the endocrine system. The endocrine glands release hormones that carry throughout the body by the bloodstream. Hopefully this doesn't offend anyone. This is in your book as well. Why do we care? Why do you have naked people on your screen? Well, because hormones like neurotransmitters carry messages, even though it's a little slower. These chemical messages organize the nervous system and body tissue, like governing you know, puberty development, and they activate behaviors such as alertness and sexual behavior. The pineal gland is located near the back of your brain and you'll need this for your worksheet. It secretes melatonin, which regulates sleep and wake cycle. So it works with the pawns in this. You see it's located near it, okay? The pituitary gland is found in the brain just below the hypothalamus. It has two parts um, to it and it controls the salt and the water in our system. For women, interestingly enough, it controls onset of labor and lactation. And then it also controls um, the secreting of growth hormones and activity in other glands. And you can see why this would be important. You have the thyroid glands and the parathyroid. And the thyroid gland is located inside the neck. It controls um, metabolism, the burning of energy, by secreting a certain hormone. And it also determines how alert one is and how thin or heavy they may be, because that metabolism piece of it. So when someone tells you that they're overweight because their thyroid isn't working, that's an actual, it could be true. The parathyroid, they're embedded in the thyroid itself, and they control the level of calcium and other um, other stuff in the body, which influences excitability. The pancreas, and it shows you where the thyroid is. The pancreas, you might be familiar with that because of diabetes, controls the level of sugar in the body by secreting insulin and other things. Too much insulin leads to hypoglycemia, where too little causes diabetes. See the glands on the top of your kidney? And it controls our stress reaction through the secretion of norepinephrine and um, um, the other hormone which activates the um, 
sympathetic nervous system. Norepinephrine raises blood pressure, constricting blood vessels. Right, and then when it raises the blood pressure, it also transmits um, to another section, releasing more hormones, prolonging the stress response. Um, it's kind of interesting because this area also secretes over 30 different hormones, controlling also in having control over salt intake, stress, and sexual development. That's why the people are naked on the screen. You have the gonads, and that's your ovaries in women and your testes in men, and they secrete hormones to regulate sexual growth, activity, and reproduction. There's information in your in your book about the effects of testosterone in the prenatal environment. Is aggression determined by the person or the environment, nature or nurture, or heredity or environment? I would encourage you to look at that in your book. Why is that? Well, there's two very different but related fields that contribute to our understanding of the influence of heredity on behavior. Behavior genetics focus is on the extent of heredity accounting for individual differences in behavior and thinking. So behavior genetics is focused on heredity. Evolutionary psychology, which you should be slightly familiar um, with from chapter one, it's evolutionary roots of behaviors and mental processes that all humans share, and this is in about environment. The goal of behavioral gen um, genetics is to identify what genes contribute to the traits that humans exhibit. The book explains the functioning of genes, but I'm not going to go through that in this course. But I want you to know the difference in the types of studies. You have family studies. It's the heritability in humans based on the assumption that if genes influence a certain trait, close relatives should be more similar than distant relatives. Again, that genetic predisposition. Twin studies identical versus paternal twins, because identical twins have the same genes, influence of heredity and environment. You read about twin studies all the time when you read psychological articles. Identical twins, um, like I said, are genetically identical. Paternal twins um, are no more um, genetically similar than um, other siblings. Any differences in identical twins must be environment or experience due to the genes being the same. So if there's identical twins raised together, um, are no more alike in some characteristics than fraternal twins, then heredity must not be very important for the characteristic study. Adoption studies are interesting because it focused on those adopted at birth and raised by parents not genetically, supposedly genetically related to them. Some adopt Adoptions happen um, with kin. Sometimes those are referred to as kinship adoptions or kinship care. Um, adoption studies provide additional information about the relative influence of heredity environment. We'll often reference studies such as twin studies, especially in regards to disorders. Is someone more likely to get a mental illness if a family member has it? Many studies have considered such. Use this information as you study the disorder that you will. Not only do humans respond to their environment, but humans also shape their environment. They inherit predispositions which compel them to seek environments that complement these predispositions. Therefore, genes and environment interact in such intricate and subtle ways, it's hard to separate out and isolate the effects of heredity environment. It, it can often lead to misguided or harmful actions or assumptions. I can't assume that someone's better with their biological family than with a family that will adopt them. Um, so there used to be psychologists that would take very hard stances on the debate of nature versus nurture. Um, that has lessened more so in recent years. Then you have evolutionary psychology, and we talked about how it tries to explain the behavioral trait that people have in common. Shared traits are re the result of natural selection. And if you remember Darwin's theory of natural selection, organisms that adapt best to the environment tend to survive and pass that genetic characteristic to subsequent um, generations. Those organisms who adapt less successfully to the environment tend to vanish. That's more true of um, animals than humans. 
But it's not about the survival of the fittest for people. It's about those behaviors. What allows us to continue today, to advance today, etc.? What behaviors do we no longer need? What must we have? How are we different than 100 years ago? 75 and 76 of your text does a great job further explaining evolutionary psychology. Take the time if you're interested and read that. That concludes PowerPoint um, in this unit. If you need the acknowledgement, let me know. Make sure you watch the supplement videos. They are required.